A CPAC straw poll for the 2024 presidential election showed that 55% of Republicans at that conference would vote for Donald Trump in the primary. Former Deputy Chief of Staff for George W. Bush, Carl Rove, explained on Fox News why, in his view, these numbers might not be as positive for Trump as they seem. 55% said that they would vote for him. I thought that Bingo. number might have been higher. Well, well absolutely. Bingo. I, I, I agree entirely with you. Remember, this is a group that came to this meeting for largely one reason. President Trump was going to be there. This yeah. is the truest Trump believers. And, and for him to only get 55% says, as I said in my column, he is losing strength because he's not introducing something new. He's losing strength whether he recognizes it. Mm -hmm. And I think if I were them, I'd, be, I'd, I'd take that as a cautionary note. He needs to refresh his act. He needs to, he needs to change and he needs to offer a vision for the future. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So president and founder of Solidarity Strategies, author of T.O. Bernie, former senior advisor of Sanders campaign, Chuck Rocha, and White House reporter for Real Clear Politics, Phil Wegman, back to discuss. Phil, let me start with you. Uh, I was also intrigued by that. All the caveats. Rand Paul has won the CPAC straw poll. This was down in Florida. But Carl does have a point, which is that most of the people who came to this thing were for Trump. So if only he's only winning 55 percent of those people at basically the Trump love fest, then that actually could be a problem. How do you see this number and maybe more in the context of Trump's actual hold on the GOP? No question he's the most popular figure, but to the extent of how popular is he actually? Yeah. Well, first of all, it shows that there's doubts among Republicans of uh, should Donald Trump get a third time. Yes, he got a lot of applause uh, for those lines during his speech. But I think a similar sentiment is seeping in on the right, which is uh, similar to what we saw on the left during the primaries. Uh, there were a lot of folks who weren't necessarily um, excited about Joe Biden, but they thought that he could win. I think that there are going to be a lot of people whose strong preference come 2024 and the run up to it is who can win. Uh, maybe Republicans are going to take a step back and say, uh, you know, maybe it's not the candidate who's most exciting or who can, you know, own the libs the best, but maybe it's a candidate who can actually get to the finish line. And I think that, yeah. 55% at CPAC is really interesting because it shows that those uh, true Trump supporters can go down there uh, and vote for someone else besides Donald Trump within eye distance of the golden calf that yeah. was down there. The golden <laughs> yeah. Trump like, it's not mesmerizing as I have a complete total hold yeah. on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was surprised at this too, Chuck, because this is like, I mean, we shouldn't think of this as like a conservative political conference. This was like a Trump rally. Yeah. And at the Trump rally, only roughly half were like, yeah, I guess I go for Trump again. Um, the largest second chunk was Ron DeSantis, which makes sense because it was down in Florida. But I did think that this was pretty surprising. I thought at this conference, as centered around Donald Trump and oh, the election stolen and all of this as it was, I thought that ultimately he would be, you know, 70, 80, 90 percent among these attendees. This is what we're showing now is if it wasn't Trump, um, who would be the top pick? And again, DeSantis gets a massive home field advantage. I would say Christy Noem is someone else to watch there. But weigh in on the Trump piece, Chuck. I think if you just look at this pragmatically, and I hate doing this because I'm talking about Donald Trump supporters and CPAC and using the word pragmatically that I can hardly even say, I would say that he's got unlimited money and unlimited name ID. And I would remind all of you this, you're right, the number does seem a little low, but this nomination is for him to lose. And I don't care who runs, long mm -hmm. as there's more than three or four fellas or ladies that run. Because remember my Bernie Sanders strategy back in the day? Long as there were three or four people running, Bernie Sanders had the best core of support to win the nomination. If it gets down to just two, we got a problem. Same thing with Donald Trump. Long as he's running in a multi-candidate primary in 2024, if he decides to run, there's nobody even close because his supporters, sure. no matter what, even though what you saw in this little convention, he has money and he has name ID, and that's all you really need, a la, have you seen who's president right now? Joe Biden had some name ID. Right. Well, no, look, uh, Phil, to that point, I have zero question, zero, that if Trump wants a nomination, it is his. My uh, real <laughs> okay, question good. is, is to the extent whenever he runs, is he going to be able to garner the same amount of support he did in 2020 in 2024? That is where I actually don't think so, given January 6th. But also, just look, some people are beginning to have some doubts. All it takes is on the margins, and then you don't win. You know, already you already lost the election, but then you might lose Georgia again, Arizona again. You could even lose North Carolina, somewhere like that, with a 1% or a 2% drop in turnout amongst Republicans. That's kind of where I'm looking at, Phil. What do you think? Yeah, well, I think that what's 
interesting here is Republicans know that Donald Trump is the most popular Republican among their base. And so they're not going to criticize him publicly because they don't want to be ostracized uh, like those who voted for impeachment. Mm -hmm. That's a big political risk. But I think the Republican machinery is looking around and saying this guy lost us the White House. We lost the House. We lost the Senate. Uh, down in Georgia, we didn't have a compelling argument. And so the Republican infrastructure, I think, is going to say, all right, what did we do wrong in 2015 and 2016? And is it possible for us to remedy that this time around? I'm not certain uh, that it necessarily is possible for the, the party to sort of um, smother his candidacy before it gets started. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, this is a completely different uh, ball game, maybe, you know, Trump mm -hmm. doesn't have Twitter to get around the media. Also, Trump is going to be as a private citizen uh, facing, you know, legal challenges. So, so maybe uh, he doesn't have the, the appetite come 2024. We'll have to see. But there's a lot of nervous Republicans looking around who thought that it was their turn to run for president and uh, are wondering whether or not there's going to be any oxygen left. Yeah, well, and Chuck, here's point. the thing. I mean, he's oriented the entire party around just him. So he's kind of scrambled the circuitry in terms of what the Republican Party even stands for. It used to be that you'd say, like, the Democrats are kind of all over the place in what they stand for, but you knew the Republicans, they're anti-tax, they're pro-free trade, like, they, they're anti-regulation. You had this very clear, albeit, in my view, abhorrent agenda. Now... The policy was basically non-existent at this conference. It was all just about sort of cultural tokens and also Donald Trump himself. So that means even if he decides ultimately not to run, he's going to lay his hands on whoever he wants the next successor to be. And that's basically going to be that. Well, that's part of it. And I think you're right about, you know, the ideologues thinking about him, you know, as a personality. But I would also think a little bit about what happens in the 2022 election. I hate to keep going back to that. But look, mm -hmm. there's there's super thin majorities in both houses. Democrats have a very, very big uphill climb to hold both of those majorities in an off year election when we control the presidency. Let's just say that we did because it's going to be a unique time with redistricting, with COVID. It's just another unique election. We say that every time. If Democrats were to control both, I think folks are looking much differently at a Donald Trump primary and then a Donald Trump nomination. And if the Republicans pick up both House and the Senate, show that they have power, again, it changes the dynamic, I think, of where we are in a presidential election. And I think that those two things have the biggest impact on what happens in that primary over everything else. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's a really, really smart point. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll have more rising for you after this.